Hi everyone, thanks for watching today's video. Today is the second part of a two-part video on colonoscopy, which is a flexible camera test or an endoscopy of the bottom end, which is looking into our colon or our large intestine. In my last video, I spoke about the instrument, what it looks like, how far does it go into our colon, and also the cost of the procedure. Today, I'm going to talk about the pre-procedure preparation, which means that what preparation is given to the patient before the test and how is the test done and what to expect when you go into the endoscopy unit and also the complication that may or may not happen during or after the test. So first thing is the preparation. What do you expect before the test? So the practice varies from one center to the other. However, the first thing you will get is an appointment. Either it will be on the telephone or by post or both. You'll be given a choice of the dates and times, and you can pick a choice. This is a practice for most units. Some units might not give you a choice. However, I think you will have the opportunity to change the appointment if necessary. The second thing you will get is a leaflet in which you will get all the instructions, what to eat, what not to eat before the test. 24 to 48 hours before the test, uh, almost every center will ask you to go on a special diet. The purpose of this diet to, is to reduce the residue in our intestine. So the laxative that is sent to you by post or you are asked to collect the laxative from the unit can clean the bowel out. Now, what is this laxative? It is a very strong salt solution, tastes quite horrible. Most of them taste horrible. And it is supposed to clean the bowel out. You drink a few sachets of it a day before or sometime in the morning of the test as well. And that will clean the bowel out completely. So when you go for the procedure, the colon is clean and the endoscopist can see what they want to see to make the diagnosis. You'll be also given instructions about which medications that you are already on to take and which to skip. Most of the medication that you normally take, like the blood pressure tablets, etc., they are allowed to continue. Some medications you might have to stop like blood thinning tablets like warfarin, epixaban, which thin the blood, they might have to be stopped. Again, the practice varies from one unit to the other. Some will ask you to stop, some will not ask you to stop. So that is the main preparation that you do at home before you come into the unit. So what will happen when somebody comes into the endoscopy unit to have the procedure done? So I have divided that into four subheadings. The first thing that will happen, that patient will be admitted. What does that mean? So a nurse will take the patient to their symptoms, their allergies, their medications, what preparation they have taken and how did it work. And the procedure is done either under sedative, which means a needle is put into patient's arm, a venflon, which is a plastic needle, and through it, uh, some medications are given to relax the patient, it's not anesthetic. The patient, when they go into the endoscopy room, which will they go afterwards, uh, where they will be given these medications to make them relax and also painkillers are given. As I explained before in my first video, the procedure can be uncomfortable and can be at times painful. So sedation is an option for patient to take. If the patient does not want to take sedative, then the other option is Entonox, which is gas and air, which you might have heard about given to ladies when they're going through childbirth. It's a good painkiller and does control the pain when the patient is going through the procedure. So the patient has a choice of taking either of the two. The difference between the two is that after sedation, patient is not allowed or told not to use any machinery or dry for 24 hours because the sedative remains in their bloodstream for about 24 hours and then can affect their judgment and can cause harm. With gas and air, it does not stay in the system for very long and they can, after a while, even drive home if they wish to and they can go to their normal activities in a few hours time. The second thing the patient will go through is a consenting for the test, which means that they are informed how the test is done, what complications can happen, whether they'll be given sedation or entonox or whatever, if they've chosen nothing at all, then that is an option as well. And 
the patient signs the consent form and the consenting doctor or the nurse will countersign the form. And in most centers, the patient will be given the copy of the consent form. The next thing that happens, the patient, if they can walk, they walk to the endoscopy room, they're laid on a trolley facing the left hand side. So the screen is in front of them and they can, if they are awake enough, they can watch what's happening on the screen in their colon. A nurse will be sitting next to them who looks after their blood pressure, their pulse, their breathing, etc. and make sure the patient is comfortable and safe. There is an endoscopist, obviously, who is either a consultant doctor or a nurse who are doing the procedure. And there is a second nurse standing next to the endoscopist who will assist the endoscopist with either biopsies or cutting out polyps or doing any other tests that necessary. Once the procedure is finished and the patient is stable and um, the patient is recovering well from the procedure, then the patient is handed over to the recovery staff, which again are usually nurses and they are informed the findings of the procedure. A report, copy of the report is given to the patient in most centers, but definitely in almost every case, the copy of the report will be sent to their own doctor, either by email or by post, depending on the unit and where you are in the world. So all of this usually takes about hour and a half to two hours in the unit. The procedure itself takes about 15, 20 minutes. In the recovery, you are given some refreshments like tea, coffee, squash, biscuits, etc., or sometimes sandwiches as well. And um, the whole process takes about a couple of hours to do. Somebody had asked me whether they can have a general anesthetic for the procedure or not. General anesthetic is not a routine way of doing colonoscopy in most countries and most units that I know of, especially in adults. It is routinely given to children when they are having a colonoscopy done for obvious reasons because they can't tolerate the procedure they easily. It's quite stressful for them. I presume in a very small percent of people, maybe in some countries, a colonoscopy can be done under general anesthetic, but most patients will either have a choice of sedative, antonox, or if they wish to have nothing at all. So what can go wrong during a colonoscopy? A number of things can go wrong during a colonoscopy and these are recognized complications which mean they can happen with any endoscopies in any endoscopy unit. Luckily, thank God, they're not very, very common complications and the complication rate with most colonoscopy may be one in a thousand, one in two thousand. However, as advanced colonoscopies happen, which means endoscopies are cutting out polyps, doing major procedures for removing tumors, etc., then obviously these complications can become more common and the risk can increase to 1 in 500 or even 1 in 100 or 1 in 200. So the main complications that are worth talking about is bleeding. Bleeding does not happen uh, very commonly just with a colonoscopy itself. However, when endoscopies cut out polyps and cut out tumors, then obviously big blood vessels can open and bleeding can happen. Bleeding can happen at the time of the procedure itself. To reduce the risk of bleeding, endoscopies, when they are cutting out polyps and tumors, do inject substances into the tumor or into the polyp, which reduce the risk of bleeding. However, that substance does not work forever and after uh, 12 to 24 hours when the substance stops working, in most cases bleeding will not happen. However, in occasional patients, bleeding can happen even several days after the polyp or the tumor has been cut out. The second thing that can happen obviously is a hole in the colon which is a perforation. This is an extremely serious complication. Both of these are, but this is extremely serious complications. Tiny little perforations can be sealed by putting clips uh, during a colonoscopy or even after the procedure. Uh, some of them don't require any major operations. However, a reasonable size perforation which can happen at any colonoscopy, the risk increases when polyps or tumors are cut and that perforation can require a major operation to correct. Miss pathology, what does that mean? Which means uh, sometimes uh, during a colonoscopy, polyps can be missed or some other abnormality can be missed because there are lots of corners in the colon, as I showed you in my previous video, lots of twists and turns in the colon, lots of folds in the colon, 
and the polyp can be sitting around a band or something which colonoscope can't easily look at. Hence, most endoscopists will spend a very long time coming out to uh, make sure they don't miss anything. However, there is a miss rate with almost every colonoscopy. Thank God there is a miss, not very high miss rate for major uh, pathologies like cancer, etc. However, small cancers or small polyps can be missed in up to 5% of patients or procedures. I hope you found this video informative and if you have any questions, please write them in the comment section and I will be happy to answer them if I can. And please remember to subscribe to support my channel. Thanks for watching again.